Hi, my name's Keith Cooper in North Light Images and uh, in this video I'm going to talk about the whole process of making a large print. Um, it's a large black and white print right from getting out the car, deciding I was going to take a photo, through to processing the image, to how I would process the image for a particular print size, and then on to actually making a print. Now, I'm not actually going to go into great detail about the uh, precise process, since that varies for every single image you're likely to take, uh, varies by print size and loads of other things. But this is an up-to-date version of an article I wrote a while ago about making uh, this particular print. And I've gone back to this and looked at how things have changed uh, since when I originally made the print back in 2005. Now, the original image and the print is here. Now, any of you who've come across my black and white test image um, may recognize the image. This is a print I made in 2005. It's lasted well. Um, I'm actually going to be printing it on the same paper because um, it's a paper I like and one that works very well for this image. But I'll cover that in a bit. But this is the image I made then. I'm going to go back to the camera raw file, explain what to do and uh, look at making another print. The actual picture was taken in Washington State in September 2004. I was driving along Highway 101 besides Hood Canal and um, it was a grey damp day as it's quite often in those areas and um, I just saw a nice looking view. Now the thing is a, a great view can be a great view to stand and look at it can be a great view that you can turn into a print or it can be a great view that no matter how you photograph it you never really capture it as a print and it's capturing an aspect of the scene and to show that I've got the entire sequence um, only 13 of pictures that I took at that point where I got out of the car I walked down and I'll, I'll cut these into the video so um, you can see a bit more detail of them well, that is obviously limited by the video format. Here's where I got out, walked down to the water, looked around, I said there was a lot of structure in the sky, there's mist, there's low cloud. This right away said to me this is going to make a black and white print. And there are a few things you do if you're taking stuff for a black and white print. I overexposed slightly so that I would have not clipped because when you clip you lose information so it's overexposed slightly to make it I've got more information to work with when I convert the color file into black and white so I take the picture using my camera set normally to, as a color image and I process the raw file now the camera back then was a Canon 1DS Mark 1 the original Canon 1DS 11 megapixels on a full frame sensor. That was a lot at the time and was seriously impressive. Uh, it was expensive as well. Uh, today I would use Canon 5DS um, or maybe an R5 but I've got an R5DS here. This is 50 megapixel. That makes it a lot easier to make large prints but the principles are still the same. I'm going to cover a little bit about resizing um, old images in this as well since I've gone back and looked at how modern software can process images but most of the process I'm looking at is virtually the same as when I produced that picture for an exhibition in 2005. Anyway here's the scene I've got out we've always got a slight problem when you uh, look along a beach of some sort of how you handle the diagonal of the, this curve of that we've got these distant trees we've got a little boat um, yeah, we've got cloud, we've got detail. There's plenty of detail in this that can be picked out and there's there is colour, but there's not a lot of colour. So this is an image that as I say, I thought mm, black and white. So there we go, I've walked got out, I've walked down to the uh, shoreline. I'm looking across the water, nice and still, not perfect reflections, but we're getting a bit of it. Move to another shot. 
This is probably taken with a 16 to 35 lens. Uh, it's quite wide angle. I'm just exploring here, just looking at and thinking, what am I going to do about this scene here? The boat, where it's positioned. Does it look right? Does it fit? And I'm, I'm not certain. I move back a bit, get a bit more of the uh, beach in. And you can see this is where the road is at the back here. Turned out this is a, a small state park. Um, it's bigger now, with a lot. I haven't been past it for a few years yet, but it's bigger than it was in 2004. But it is still there on Highway 101. So there we've got the view. Yes, that's okay. Let's look the other direction. Well, it's... well, we have a seagull and that's about it. Um, maybe I can... and I have stitched these two to get a feel for it, but you know, it, it wasn't really one for a panoramic. So we're back to that. What works? I've walked work back a bit more. No. Put a longer lens on. I've put a 7200 2.8L uh, and this is about 190mm. This is nearly full telephoto. I've decided to concentrate on this detail. It's just, it looks, it looks interesting. However, this first shot, I got the truth. I don't like the angle of the boat facing straight onto me, nor do I like, it's too central. And also there's not enough being made of this sky at the top here. So we go to the next one. Remember I'm moving along the beach as well, which is uh, not, uh, I'm at the limit of zoom for this. We've got this nice line of mist on the water running across here. And we've got the shapes of the trees in the mist. And um, it's probably spitting rain while I'm, I'm doing this. But anyway, we'll move back. There we go. That's a bit more like I'm a bit happier with this. I've moved this across. I'm still not sure about this and what to do about this tree. Things at the edge of a frame and you know, you can crop if you wish. I don't have no problems with cropping, but how to handle objects at the edge of the frame. Um, do you want just a bit of them? It ties the scene to the frame or do you want a gap? Now here the gap creates more space on the edge here and separates this area from over here. And also this is perhaps a little far over. So there we go, we'll move it across a bit. I'm now happy with the frame cutting through the edge of that tree. Um, it's you know, a personal choice as to how you like composition and things. There are various things. Any photographer who gives you a long list of the various rules and principles they followed in order to get a, a picture is doing it after they've taken the photograph. Um, I never think much about formal rules of composition when I'm doing things. I might, I might occasionally think about balance, empty space, things like that. But I really don't go into all the details that you'll find in, a, in an essay or article about photo composition. Um, most of it is having a good eye and being able to see and visualize a picture. Um, I've got a bit of beach here, which I don't really like. Um, I want this lowering down. I've moved along and the boat is now in a slightly better position. Okay, that, that's much better. Um, I've lost a bit of tree here, but I've gained a bit on the side. I'm, I'm still not sure about that. We'll go, there we go. We've moved around a bit more. Boats more over this way tree I'm quite happy with this edge just touching the edge of the tree we've got picnic benches on that and it's it's looking fairly okay but there's this line of mist here that just doesn't do anything and it doesn't really show at the back here so I walked back up the beach towards the car a bit um, and I recall it was starting to rain a bit more then and here's the photo that I've used um, I'm slightly higher, which has lowered the boat, now, has meant that this line of mist is now continuous and joins up and separates the distant hills, or um, just a, not really hills at this stage, you can't see the hills in this, right? it's just too misty and damp. And we've got shapes over here, I'm, quite, I'm happy with that composition. Um, that's 13 photos I've taken. Um, at this point, it either was raining too much or I was bored with this and thought I'd got the picture and off I went.
I was at the location no more than 15, 20 minutes at the outside. And it was purely because I was driving along, saw a bit of landscape and thought, yeah, that's interesting. There's a picture there. So there we go. There's the picture that um, I'm going to base it on. It's exposed fairly light. So we've not got much detail in this in the sky here. I'm going to bring that out later. But other than that, I'm fairly happy with it. And I'll now go to the uh, actual raw file. Now, I'm using Photoshop CS6 here. That's ancient version of Photoshop, but it has all the essential tools. And the only tool I need here is a curve. I just need a simple curve to apply to this image and I can fix it and convert it to black and white. But anyway, if I open the raw file, we have raw file here. Um, things I'd notice about processing uh, the raw file. I'm intending to take this image, which is only 4000 by 2700 pixels. 11 megapixel is not that big. I want to make at least an A2, probably a larger picture for this, so I'm going to need to resize. That means I need to pay a bit more attention to things like sharpening and detail. So whilst I've got the image here, and it seems that I shot this for some reason at f3.5, a 320th of a second. Um, I'd not had the camera very long at the time and I was still experimenting. It's one of the reasons I went on the trip. Um, I look at some of my uh, decisions about exposures here as to why I took them and I'm still not entirely certain why I picked particularly. If I was to take the picture today, I would probably use a slightly smaller aperture to get a bit more detail in the picture. Certainly with a 50 megapixel camera, um, I'd want a bit more and probably a newer version of the lens. Now, I've still got this 70 to 200 lens and it's fine. Um, it works. I don't use telephoto very often, but this is more than good enough for what I want. And here it is. We've got the image. Um, there's very little I'm going to adjust in it. Um, we can maybe set uh, in terms of the settings. I don't want any lens corrections. I don't want anything changing the picture very much, but I will, and I have checked this um, against in processing later on, I will use the remove chromatic aberration because there is a bit of chromatic aberration. If I zoomed in on some of these fine branches around here, you would see a little bit of color fringing. That fixes that. I know it's a black and white image, but color fringing leads to loss of detail in black and white images. So we want to reduce that. Other than that, in terms of sharpening, this depends very much on what I'm going to do with the image. To me, all sharpening at any stage from opening the raw file right through to final before printing has a creative element about it. There is no automatic sharpening. It is what is needed for the image. All of this area here, for example, there's no really fine detail. There is detail here if you zoom right into it, but um, it's not much. There is no real fine detail in this. That really needs no sharpening. Um, I've also I've set the noise reduction at quite a low level as well. Um, I've shot this. This is done at ISO 100. Um, anything much above about 400 on the old 4, uh, 1DS, you would start to see more noise and things that would need dealing with. But I'm happy with this just as a Im simple image. And I'm opening this up in the Pro Photo color space. This is one of the few times I always use Pro Photo is for black and white. The reason is Pro Photo retains as much of the color information, oh, and I'm working at 16 bit as well in this. Profoto retains as much of the colour information as possible. Colour variations, when you convert to black and white, transform into tonal variations. The more variation and detail in colour that you retain, the more chances you have of bringing that, dis that detail into the black and white image. So it's just something I would say, Profoto, always work with that for black and white images. Um, gives you more capability. I'm going to turn this to black and white fairly soon anyway, but uh, at this point I'll just do that. So 
I've got my image there, it's an 11 megapixel image, so we'll uh, open that. Now, I'm going to resize this. I'm not going to do it on this laptop here because it isn't powerful enough for it. Um, I'm going to use Topaz AI Gigapixel, or Gigapixel AI, to do the resizing. And it does very good resizing up to large sizes. Um, certainly, if I'm taking this image and I'm printing it, um, I want to rescale it to 600 pixels per inch, um, at least A2 size. Uh, so that's quite an expansion, roughly a four times expansion. Um, I know from experience that it works very well on that software, certainly better than any other method um, I've used in recent years for fine detail. But this is a sort of an option. You don't need to do this. This is just because I'm making a big print from an old file. So it's uh, embedded pro photo. Use the embedded color space. There we go. And there is the image. Now I'm going to work just here to show you the curve on this image unresized. Um, the uh, laptop slows down a bit if I'm uh, opening sort of 800-900 megabyte in images. Um, it's, it really does slow things down a bit. But there's the basic colour image. All I'm going to do for conversion and there are lots of ways of it, and I've looked at aspects in other videos and articles um, about this. Um, all I'm going to do is, is a very simple, straightforward conversion from colour to black and white. Um, there are fancier ways, but I'll show in a bit some potential problems you get with those. All I really need to do for this is image adjustment, black and white. Now I'm using the default Photoshop change here it's going to convert that to black and white. There we go. Now, you can play around and tweak the settings a little bit here, but don't try and do too much at this point. So there's the black and white image. The problem is, I'll make it a bit larger there, and I, I should mention that I've actually got this particular monitor, the BenQ SW2700. Um, I've got it hardware profiled to a colour temperature of about 4,500 K. That's very low, far lower than you'd normally work. I've done that specifically so it doesn't look too blue in the lighting here with the video. Uh, normally I'd work with it uh, in, certainly not in conditions like this, um, I'd work in dimmer lighting and I'd work with it set to a uh, D65, maybe D55, but uh, this is just for showing on the video. Here's the image here. Now the simple adjustment here is I'm going to add a layer, I'm going to add a curves adjustment layer. Now, here's the curve. It's just a line you bend. Now, let's just convert this image. From, I'll change the mode to grayscale. Converted the image to grayscale here just to make it easier, uh, smaller and faster to work on here. Um, there's no real difference in working on an RGB version of a black and white image, which is where R equals G equals B for each pixel, or a grayscale one. Um, there's no difference. Some software, um, Sharpner, Nick Sharpner, which I use occasionally, requires an RGB file. So even though this is a grey, grey gamma 2.2 color space, it's a black and white one, uh, I will at some point for sharpening would need to convert this back to RGB. As long as I take it back to a gamma 2.2 space, such as Adobe 98, um, I've got no problem. There's not going to be any changes or shifts. But the key here is this curve. Now, if I just move the endpoints, I can lighten the whole thing. I can darken the whole thing. We just don't want much to. So what I'm going to do is just take a fairly steep curve there 
and for this curve I am only looking at its effect on the sky, the water, these distant trees on the misty bits. No matter that this bit is too black, we'll deal with that in a moment. So one curve adjustment, because if I look at the shape of the curve, I can see there's a main bump, which is all the light gray, and there's another bump on one side, which is the darker bits. So that's adjusted the curve for the sky. If I now adjust further down, add another point and bend the curve, I can adjust the details here and bring out some more detail on this spit and the boat. Now there are just a couple of points on this curve and just by changing these two curves I can change the tonal balance of the light part of the screen and the dark part of the image um, and that's all it takes. Now, if you have a look at the written article that I've got, that uh, the, the older article that goes into more details, is it got it's got lots more options of why I picked different aspects of the curves, how I adjusted things, and design. Very difficult to show here on the video, and there is utterly no point at all in doing a screen recording of me doing stuff here because I'm trying to show the principles, not the actual details. I'm very loath to give precise step-by-step -step recipes for doing adjustments for photos because I feel that misses the point. It's the principle of what you're doing is important and it will be different for every single image. So here we have an image I'm relatively happy with. Um, I could save that, do that, work on various things. I can tweak this curve a little bit. Um, there's not much more needs to be done to it. That's it. I've handled the tonality of this dark bit and I've handled the tonality of the sky. What it actually looks like, yeah, that's, that'll come out later. So we'll just get rid of that. So there we've got that. Now, if I was resizing, I would have resized the colour image not the black and white. So I would have done resizing with a colour image before I do the conversion to black and white. So if I go to the examples here, now I'll just close these windows down and show you the sharpening. One of the problems, um, and I've produced versions of the file at uh, the, the colour file at no sharpening in the raw processing, slight sharpening in the raw processing, and my normal degree of sharpening in that. And it happens that if you're doing lots of enlargement, the amount of sharpening of your source image is critical on the results. Now, I've, I've written an article that goes into lots more detail about resizing and why sharpening matters so much in taking an old image, uh, one taken on an old camera like the 1DS, and enlarging it up to a much larger size. Now, the example I've got here, this is just some detail of it, and if I look at um, raw sharpening, I can see in the resizing, and this is deep, this is zoomed in a lot, I can see halos, I can see sharpening effects on fine lines. I've discovered that if you reduce the amount of sharpening considerably on your raw file, and this is just for this particular camera, so you'll have to do experiments with whatever you want to do, then you don't get halos, you get a much more, uh, less artifacts in the image than you would do by sharpening in the raw. So um, when people say you always have to sharpen raw files, there are times you don't need to sharpen raw files. But as I, I've, I've covered this in a lot of the articles and stuff I've done. I put links with this, because I appreciate this, is, there's quite a lot in this video. I'll put links in the text to go with it, and I'll take you through to the articles and that. Uh, please feel free to ask questions as well, but um, I'll try and cover as much as I can in this. But anyway, here's the, uh, the with no sharpening, and there are virtually no artifacts. If I look at a version of it with normal sharpening, there are artifacts. Now, these are going to be very small features on the print, but these do make a difference. 
So anyway, that's it. That's the bit of bit of resizing. Um, if you're not doing the resizing, ignore that step. We just need to think about how we're going to print the image. Now I've converted it to did the the black and white image, and here is the image I'm going to be working with or after I've been working with it. As I say, simple curve adjustment just to handle the dark areas, the light areas. What else needs doing? Well, before you uh, print it, you will need a bit of sharpening to allow for the natural softening that printing produces of ink drops on paper. Now, I'm going to print this on a um, cotton rag paper, uh, an art paper, and so it does need quite a bit of fairly subtle sharpening. Now, I can use, uh, for this, I can use Nick Sharpener. Um, there are lots of other ways of doing it. It's a tool I've used for many years. I've got articles about it as well. Um, and the reason I use it is because it gives me control over sharpening. It allows me to decide I just want sharpening in a particular area. And it allows me to give no sharpening in parts of area. Because, as I said before, cloud like this doesn't need any sharpening whatsoever, whether it's raw sharpening, while you're editing, it doesn't need any detail sharpening. And in fact, the example here, at its normal setting, there are huge sharpening halos on some of the fine detail. Um, but I, I, when I use this, I always turn it down a bit. So that's it with the sharpening. And if I turn it down, it gets rid of most of the sharpening halos. Now, what I do want, however, is what this calls uh, structure, uh, which is a sort of local contrast enhancement. And that does make a difference, but you mustn't overdo it. If I just take this to adding a bit of structure, the main differences are that it just brings out the detail a little bit more here and a little bit more detail in the cloud. Don't overdo the structure adjustments. Uh, these are the things that look over-processed. These are the things that just look bad. Now, if I go from there back to, that's the one without the structure, it's very slight. I'll show you how slight. And uh, his print. Uh, this is, uh, I need to look carefully. This is the straight version with no structure added to the image during editing. And here's the version where I've added some structure to it. Now, I'm going to be surprised if you can see much difference between these two prints. Uh, it is there, it is slight. Um, and there we go. And back again. Now, there really isn't a great deal of difference but that's the sort of stuff that you end up fine-tuning with printing. So it would also vary. Um, I might need to apply a second curve if I was showing this image in a particular dim environment or a bright environment. I might change the overall tonal curve of it. So the image that you see here on this screen, obviously through the, through the video, um, that looks fine here. When it becomes a print, there's a matter of a lightening or darkening of, uh, for an adjustment. One other thing I would uh, mention is I'm printing using the black and white print mode. Now, I have loads of uh, videos and articles about uh, black and white printing. And invariably, if a black and white print mode is available for a, a printer, I prefer to use that. Um, in this, because I know that on this particular paper with that printer, there is an ever so slight crunching of shadows. I would add another adjustment curve just to open up some of the shadow detail on the print. So that's areas around here. And it's one of the reasons this image is on my black and white test image, because I know what this should look like. Um, and if your printer crunches up shadows, this will appear as a near solid dark black block. Uh, so it makes it good for testing as well. But anyway, there's the image printed. I've printed it from Photoshop. I could have printed it via the Epson print software. I could have printed it if I was printing it on a Canon printer. I could have used the Canon print software. Um, 
it doesn't really matter. The key things are what I've done in going from obviously taking the photo, going through the whole process, arriving at an image that I'm happy to print. There are adjustments you'll need for print. So if you were to print this on a glossy paper, it would look quite different. You might need to change the tone of balance. Um, I like it on this paper. I like it on a, this is a smooth, natural paper. And it's a paper I prefer using for prints like this. But there you have it. The real key for creating this print was the photographs I took at the start. Um, you might look at aspects of fine detail, other things like that. When people look at prints, they're not interested. The fine detail contributes to it, but it's only other photographers who really get the magnifying glass out and look at the fine detail and, um, and worry about that. The real important thing for a print is, to me, does it convey the right feel for the scene, for you know, what I wanted at the time. There's no deep message in this. Um, I'm sure if I had to put it into a show somewhere, I could come up with some suitably convoluted uh, artist statement uh, about my aims and expressions and what I wanted to achieve through my photography. Complete hokum. Um, it would be made up on the spot just for that. Um, so but basically, if you read an artist statement uh, ever by me, I always assume that it's been written for a very particular audience and that uh, I don't actually agree with one word of it, probably. But anyway, back to this, we've got an image that's gone from a set of images I took through to the final print. Um, I've got loads more bits and pieces like this I can do for videos. Please do have a look at all the uh, detailed stuff in the notes that go with the video. Please subscribe to the channel if you find it useful. Feel free to ask questions, but above all, if there's something interesting in this, do check the website links as well, because I have a lot more detail on the website than I could usually fit into videos. So hopefully that's been of some help, so thank you very much.